We're going to look at 2 Timothy this evening. 2 Timothy. We sort of finished up 1 Timothy this past week. and It's been four years. It's been four years or so since 1 to 2 Timothy letter. and It's been four years or so and since Timothy has been pastoring the church at Ephesus. He's been faithful in doing it. He's been strong in doing it. He's been a faithful companion of of Paul. and He's been alongside Paul for some missionary journeys and the second and third missionary journeys that we we know of. And he served in Corinth and Philippi and Troas. He's fought the fight and he's... He's followed the lead that Paul has paved for him. He's followed the lead. He's he's understood difficulties. He's understood trials. He's understood temptations. He's understood those things that come with ministry, that come with serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And this letter comes from Paul as he's sitting in a dark, deep dungeon in Rome. He's just before his death in A.D. 68 or so, somewhere around there from how we can do the timeline. He's just before his death and Paul pens another letter to to his young protege. His young student, if you will, Timothy. Paul knew, if, if you read as we read through 2 Timothy, you'll see little hints in especially 1 in, in 4, 6 where he talks about I, I basically there's no hope for my deliverance. I know my death is near. I know it's around the corner. He was inspired to, to realize that by the Holy Spirit to, to realize that his physical death was but right around the bend. And, and even through all that, he, he, he was writing this letter and sort of a letter of encouragement as he passes on the mantle of ministry from himself to Timothy. And he's encouraging Timothy to, to continue on. He's exhorting him to continue on to remain faithful in his duties of spreading the gospel, of, of leading the church at Ephesus. and He wants to see Timothy continue to, to hold on to sound doctrine, to not be swayed by, by man, to not, be, to not be fearful, but sort of preach relentlessly, sort of preach with a, with a relentless mindset, to not be, to not be swayed by the, the flow of humanity and people's desires and wants and whatever interest they have that's outside of true worship of Christ. In verse 1 of chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus, he's sort of reminding Timothy and those who would read the letter He's an apostle of Christ by the will of God. Paul says, this this letter from me, I'm chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I'm chosen by Him. I'm His. He's chosen me for this purpose. He's chosen me for this task. I guess before Calvinism there was Second Timothy chapter one one and other passages of scripture. Paul says, I'm chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus. This is his will according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father, Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
Well, sin, you know, despite everything, Timothy, despite who we are amongst one another, I'm I'm chosen for this task, and you're chosen for this task, and, and may we carry it out effectively. May we carry it out effectively. Sort of, you got to wonder if he doesn't open up this letter and, and outlining a little bit of, of his authority and, and the church and, and the way Christ has laid it out and as he's been sort of over Timothy, he's led and guided Timothy and I wonder if that's not why he opened the letter in such a, such a way. He says, I've been sent out to tell others. I've been sent out to tell others about the life He has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. This is, this is what I've been sent out to do. And He's done that. He's done that up to this point and He'll do that even up to His day of martyrdom as He carries out the promise of life in Christ Jesus. He's telling those who are, who are dead in their sins and trespasses, He's bringing the good news to them. <clears throat> He's bringing the gospel. He's bringing the fact that eternal life is faith in Christ and Christ alone. It's kind of like he's saying, Timothy, you continue to do the same. Don't you easily veer off the course. Don't easily veer off the path, Timothy. But you do the same. You spread the truth. You hold fast to the faith. You hold fast to the faith that was, that, was, that was shown to you, that was shared with you. If you jump down into verse 5 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you which was first dwelt in your grandmother Louise or Lois and your mother Eunice and I'm sure that is in you as well. Timothy, you've got a heritage. You've got faith and it's it was given to you, the understanding of Christ. They shared with you eternal life in Christ alone. And you take what you know. Take what you've been taught. Take what has been shared with you from your grandmother and your mother. Shared with you from me. Take it. Like I said before, Timothy's just, he's already been on it the second and third missionary journey with, with Paul. <clears throat> so he's seen so much, he's learned so much, he's been taught so much. Said in the past, he sat at the feet of a, of a great teacher, a great human leader. Like you said, I believe because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then you believe because of your mother and your grandmother, and you're exactly right. And it's it's the same gospel. You're so you're so right. It's the same truth. It's the same redeemer. 
There's nothing different. Nothing different to it. Just know a little bit more on this side of it. It says in verse 2, My beloved son, to Timothy my beloved son, such a care for Timothy that he had. He had a strong bond with him. He had a strong spiritual bond. That he that he look I mean it's very few times do you really meet somebody that 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 looks at somebody else that's not blood if you will, physical blood and looks at them as a son or a daughter. That only happens when there's a strong bond. That's, there's been a bit of a bond that's been nurtured, that's been, that's been cultivated. And my, to Timothy, my beloved son, my son in the faith is what he's saying. May grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Christ Jesus our Lord. My son in the faith. You're my son in the faith, I, I took you under my wing. I taught you. His great point, his care to for Timothy not to be a stumbling block in the service of Christ, not to be that guy, not to be that person, and all the way up through it. I mean, right there was a great a, 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 an example that Paul was using for Timothy. You know, Timothy, you're not to be a stumbling block. Timothy, you're to remain faithful. Timothy, Christ needs to be priority number one within the church. Timothy, Christ needs to be priority number one in your service. It, 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 example after example after example after example, and second and the third missionary journeys that Timothy went with Paul over and over again. He's given example, example, how to be a what? How to be a godly leader within the church. How to be a man of God within the church. How to be a man of God, not just in the church, but outside the church. I've said it before. This It's easy to play the part when you come in the door a few hours a week. It's not really difficult. But how to be that man outside the church. How to serve well outside the church in the missionary journeys and, and serve others. How to do it well. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience. Here's what Justin just brought up. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience. The way my forefathers did. As I constantly remember you in prayer night and day. Great point. The same gospel. The same gospel. Nothing different. Nothing different. The same truth. Just as my ancestors did, or more, my forefathers did. I served him well. In other words, if I served him well, Timothy, 
with a clear conscience. You need to serve Him well. You need to serve Him well. If He served Him well, we need to serve Him well. To serve Him, to honor Him, to glorify Him, to praise Him. It's very interesting at the end of verse 3, he says, I, I'm constantly, I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. You're constantly in my prayers. In my prayers night and day, I constantly remember you. I said before, that bond, that bond, that nurturing bond, it was, it was tight between him and Timothy. It was strong. There's a passage of Scripture where Timothy even, as Paul left him at one time, Timothy shed tears. And, because it was a strong bond. Constant in prayer night and day. And we pray here at the church and every week for the most part is for each other and for ministries and not just to fill in the time that's not what it's about but to constantly be in prayer for for those that are going to be serving the Lord what, what this upcoming week as an example you, Vern Hall handed out you know, evangelism tracts and whoever's going to go and you guys will be here this Saturday and in Bible study and Mago Day will be in Bristol and a constant prayer and night and day if you will of praying for ministries praying for other men and women of the faith and keeping them close in our minds and our hearts and so I'll constantly remember you in my prayers you did well you did well may we learn from that May we learn from that. It picked up a verse 4. This is where it says, Longing to see you even as I recall your tears. Even as I recall your tears. I, I long to see you. There's that bond I was talking about. I, I, I recall your tears. As basically, as simply put, as when we were separated, I, I recall your tears that we had at the last parting or whatever the, whenever the parting was. Sort of an intense desire to to be back in the presence of with with Timothy. As I said before, you know, it's 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 it, it's rare to have this type of relationship, but it, it was there between these two men. One going and one coming into the ministry. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture of how we should be in our own lives. And we should be mentoring and ministering to those, you know, coming in to faith or those young in the faith and, and bringing them along. And that, you just, that's, just don't see that much anymore. It's lacking within the church as a whole. It just, I don't think there's really no good answer to it, but again, true worship is lacking. Longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. Remember, this is a letter as he's in the Rome prison. He's in a dark dungeon. And he's given this letter out He's the one writing the letter of care and, and hope and mercy and grace and longing to see. He's the one in prison. You would think it'd be the other way around. But you gotta you gotta clearly see, no doubt, that when Paul said, I've learned in everything to be content. I've learned in everything to be content. You've got to clearly see here as he's nearing death, as he makes mention of it in, in chapter 4, verse 6, 
He has learned to be content in all aspects of his life, and you clearly see that. He's learned to be content. As he's writing this letter to Timothy, where's the care? Where's the care going? The care is going to Timothy, yes, but it's going to the church. It's going for the service of Christ. It's going to Ephesus. He wants to see that the church remains strong. He wants to see that Timothy remains strong. He wants to see that he remains strong and faithful to the gospel, to Christ, to the good news, to the Redeemer of the world. And that he continues to proclaim the same gospel as Justin just mentioned back in verse 3, the way my forefathers did. You do the same. You do the same. This is a heck of a letter of encouragement. But a letter that didn't pull no punches. It seems like today when you try to give encouragement it's, and it comes across sometimes a little tough and people just kind of collapse in, especially when it's dealing with the church. They just cave in like a, like a deck of cards. And I don't know as you read some of this letter here in 2 Timothy, even in 1 Timothy there was times when, when Paul would, would tighten the grip up a little bit in his young protege. But he did that for what? For the better of Timothy. See, a lot of times we look at it, not we, but a lot of people look at it when somebody tightens the grip up and spiritual, spiritual leading of the person and the person takes offense to it, but it's for their best. I only need to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. Paul says, my joy will become again. I, I'm, I'm joyful where I'm at, but oh, I, the, the joy I'll feel, the joy I'll, I will feel when I'm back in the presence of you, Timothy. When I see you again, if that's the Lord's will, when I'm face to face with you again, there will be joy there. they will be coming together, worshiping together. They're coming together with other believers, is no matter if it's one or twenty-one or a hundred and one, coming together with other believers is a is 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 a joyful task. Not a task, is is a joyful time. It's a joyful presence. It's a thrill. To come together with another believer, to, to meet another believer for the first time. It's a joy to hear his or her testimony and to talk to them about how Christ has worked in their lives and, and you just meet them for the first time. And It's always a joy. He says, I long to be with you. Simply put, if this is the Lord's will, I'll be filled with joy if I am. I can see you again. And he says this, this is said just a little bit ago, I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Louise and your mother Eunice. I'm sure that is in you as well. Of course he's sure. He was on with him on a second or third missionary journey. He's seen the example. He's seen the effectiveness of of sharing the gospel, of raising somebody up in the fear and admonition and understanding of who Christ is by his grandmother and his mother. He's seen how effective that was. Nothing new under the sun. I'm sure there was days when his grandmother and mother would speak truth and Timothy would be like, ah, here we go again. Here they go again. Talking about Jesus again. Here goes mom with one of her talks. Here goes my grandmother with one of her talks. 
Gentry could probably relate. Here goes my dad with one of his talks. But it's the effectiveness of the of what? of instilling, installing in, in them, in that young mind at that age, many years prior to this, that Christ is the Redeemer and all that, it, it, all that, man, did it just come out in young Timothy's life. As in, the, as in the directing hand of the Lord God, He brings him into the path of the Apostle Paul and see what happens after that the effective ministry I mean Paul you know you know Paul had him for for several years but my goodness he was he was had by his grandmother and mother a whole lot longer they pretty much poured the footings and laid the foundation and Paul come along and built upon it We do the same. May we build upon that which others have laid. Yeah, you're 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 so right. I mean, your your child at five or six years old, ninety nine percent of the time is is not going to know the gospel. Is not going to probably not a believer in. But you still give that child the truth. You still raise that child up in the truth. In reciting verses or catechisms or whatever it may be, Bible stories, you're raising that child up. truth of who Christ is and I said you you you're laying the foundation and and his mother and his grandmother did such a fantastic job in doing that obviously they did Paul makes mention of it but right back to what you said it was the same gospel it was the same foundation that was laid for him was laid for Timothy no different sure that is in you well I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you which first dwelt in your grandmother Louise and your mother Eunice and I'm sure that is in you as well he says Paul basically says I, I, I see the faith I see the faith that lies within you I see the faith that lies within you life proves it your life proves it I was listening to a uh, wretched coming down the road tonight and in a witness Wednesday and it wasn't at a speed of whatever speed you listen to the stuff okay but witness Wednesday and Todd Friel was there speaking to a young lady at Georgia Tech, and she said she was a Christian. It pretty much sounded like she was, and everything she had to say. And but Todd Friel asked her. He said, "You know, your friends." He said, "If they can, if they can point anything out about your life, if they can accuse you about being." driven in one area of your life love in one area of your life what would it be and 
and you knew where he was going with this and and she mentioned church and her, her love for Christ and the evidence of that and it just kind of makes you wonder here as I see here as you know he says I, I'm sure that is in you as well I, I, I see it in you as well I see your love for Christ that's in you I see it it goes right back to us do we do we do we represent him well do, do people see it in us do people see our faith do they see what we believe do we make a point to make mention of what we believe, of where we stand in this world? Or do we just kind of just go through the motions in and out the world each and every day, just kind of going in and going out, not really, you know, not really having much care whether people understand or believe or see any, anything in us or not? And do we long to represent Him well? Can we be accused of being a believer in such a way as Paul is basically saying about Timothy? He says, I, I see your faith. I see it strong. I see it strong. And this, my nod goes to your grandmother and your, your mother for a well job, a well done job. And that takes you to verse 6 where he's, and we'll, we'll look at that down next time, but from verse 6 on, he's getting to the point where, he's getting to the point now where he's, he's telling young Timothy to, to kindle afresh the gift of God or to remind him to fan the flames, if you will the spiritual gifts that the Lord God has gave him. To fan the flames, to kindle afresh the gift of God, to remind him of to do that. To not lay it down. Whatever the gift may be, we know just by reading the life of Timothy and seeing that he's a pastor of the church and we see that area of his gifts but Paul as we close this evening seen a, in his last letter he pens it down to a, a very faithful protege in the gospel may we be faithful to one another as we're faithful to Christ may we not be the ones that we hear about that crash and burn spiritually in the the sense of they make a mess out of the ministry and there's enough of that going on. May we serve him with joy, may we serve him with faith and may we serve him with the perseverance as we learned about this past Sunday and perseverance to, to finish to go all the way to the end the glory of Christ. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we, we love You and we thank You for this time here this evening and be glorified and honored. Take this Word, Lord God, may it penetrate our hearts and minds. Your Word, 2 Timothy 1-5. through May You be magnified. We love you and we praise you and we thank you. Just for your kingdom, for your glory. Bring us back here Sunday once again. To the presence of your house. As we worship you again. And as we partake of the communion table. It's in your name we give thanks. Amen.